Good morning. It's such a pleasure to have all of you here. My name is Dr. Dorothy Fink, Deputy Assistant Secretary for Women's Health at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. On behalf of the Office of Women's Health, we are pleased to welcome you to the Endocrine Disrupting Chemicals and Women's Health Symposium. The next two days will feature speakers who will tell us how common chemicals affect a woman's body and how we can all make changes to support better health. A few housekeeping notes before we begin. We understand you might not be available to join us for the entire symposium, and we encourage you to view the agenda and join sessions as you are able. You are welcome to return if you need to exit at any point. All sessions are being recorded and will be available a few days after the event. Additionally, the chat box is available for questions to our speakers. We have a full agenda and we'll do our best to direct questions to speakers as time permits. When you submit a question, please note who your question is for, especially during panel presentations. Before the lunch break, we invite you to join the poster session featuring poster presentations. The link and instructions to join will be made available later this morning. The Office on Women's Health was established in 1991 to provide expert advice and consultation to the Secretary and serve as a coordination point throughout HHS on issues affecting the health of women and girls. We also coordinate and collaborate among federal agencies and non-governmental organizations involved in women's health activities. We have an incredible opportunity to work across the board with so many stakeholders and ensure that all women and girls achieve the best possible health. Our office leads initiatives that reach across the lifespan. We are truly committed to reaching women and girls across the lifespan, and you'll learn more about that over the next two days. Endocrine disrupting chemicals, or EDCs, affect women at every age and stage of life. Exposure to everyday chemicals and household products, beauty products, and the environment can interfere with, interfere with the body's hormones. For women, these EDCs have been associated with adverse health outcomes, such as early puberty and menopause, changes in fertility, incidence of endometriosis and fibroids, some cancers, respiratory and metabolic conditions, and others. We are really grateful to have researched better characterizing the risks of EDC exposures and more knowledge about how to minimize risks to ensure women live healthier lives. Today, leading professionals from across the country will share how women can reduce exposure to harmful substances and support better health. These nationally and internationally recognized speakers will touch on reproductive health, maternal and child health, breast cancer risk reduction, and the impact of toxins on hair. For an even more comprehensive experience, we encourage you to participate in the poster session. It is important that we continue to work together on the local, state, and national levels to identify and address the risks of EDC exposure on women. We all have a role to play. There are still questions about how these chemicals act, safe levels of chemicals, sources of exposure, risks to a woman's overall health, and ways that women and girls can stay healthy. The discussions we participate in over the course of this symposium will add value and really valuable insight to this evolving field. Thank you to all of you who have already accomplished so much in this space, in your homes, communities, lab, care facilities, and workplaces. We are glad that you're with us today. We look forward to hearing from our speakers today and tomorrow, and we really want to think about what we can do to improve all aspects of women's health. At this time, I am pleased to introduce our keynote speaker for today, Dr. Andrea Gore. Dr. Gore is a professor and classic chair in pharmacology at the University of Texas in Austin. Her research team is investigating fundamental mechanisms of how environmental endocrine disrupting chemicals perturb the developing brain sex differences in EDC actions, and transgenerational epigenetic effects. Dr. Gore's research has been funded continuously by the NIH, NSF, and Foundation since 1992. She has published four books and over 190 scientific papers on her research. She was Editor-in-Chief of Endocrinology from 2013 to 2017 and was the lead author of the Endocrine Society's two scientific statements on EDCs. Among her most notable research, teaching, and service awards 
or her election as the Fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, the University of Texas Cooperative Society's Research Excellence Award, the Endocrine Society's Laureate Award for Outstanding Public Service, and the Edith Clark Woman of Excellence Award. Dr. Gore is very active in advocacy for, mentorship of, and education of trainees. More than 150 undergraduate and graduate students of diverse interests and backgrounds have conducted independent research in her laboratory at the University of Texas at Austin. We are grateful to have you join us today, Dr. Gore. Thank you so much for that lovely introduction. And of course, I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me to be the first speaker today. It's such an honor to be able to go first. And let me get started to uh, move things along. So I'm going to, I was charged with giving an introduction to EDCs and their impact on women. So I am going to spend the first half of this talk uh, providing background information. And I'll note that the background information I'm giving, of course, will apply to both women and men. But as I move along, I will transition more into those effects of EDCs that seem to specifically affect women. And that includes not just reproductive effects, but also effects on the nervous system, which is uh, what I study. And so I will share a little bit of research on that as well. There are hundreds of thousands of manufactured chemicals uh, in this world. And of those, probably about a thousand have been shown to be endocrine disrupting chemicals or EDCs defined by the Endocrine Society as an exogenous chemical or mixture of chemicals that interferes with any aspect of hormone action. Now I'll note that while it seems from this slide that maybe there are only a thousand EDCs, there are undoubtedly tens of thousands more. It's just that most of the other chemicals have never been tested for effects on EDCs and I'm sure we're gonna find uh, many others. We can categorize EDCs a number of ways. Uh, and a good one is how we use them and come into contact with them. So this table uh, summarizes some of those uses, and of course there are many others, and provides uh, examples of each of these categories. These are, again, some of the most common pesticides, products in children's toys, products in wrapping material or containers that hold our food and our beverages, materials in our houses and in our households, uh, personal care products, antibacterials, even medical tubing. Uh, and here are some of the names of some of those EDCs. Put another way, this is what we look like in our world, a human uh, being exposed to different kinds of chemicals through our diet, through pesticide treated food, in our homes, uh, in our air and in our water, maybe even in hospitals in IV tubing. So what defines an EDC as an EDC? Obviously it has to have some effect upon the body's hormone systems. And we, um, uh, back a couple of years ago, Michelle Romero led a group to define what we consider to be the key characteristics of EDCs. And we arrived at a consensus um, that was published uh, in 2020. And here are the 10 key characteristics that we identified as uh, being those characteristics that define a chemical as an EDC. If it hits any one of these chemicals, uh, it is likely to cause some kind of change in the body and lead to some sort of sequelae that might result ultimately in some sort of endocrine disease or neurological problem. And just very briefly, uh, these characteristics included um, actions on, on hormone receptors because um, we know that many EDCs act as hormone uh, receptor agonist antagonists. 
They can affect the expression of a receptor and then within the cell that expresses that receptor, uh, signal transduction pathways cause epigenetic alteration. Uh, EDCs have been shown to affect the synthesis, the transport, the distribution, and the breakdown of hormones, uh, their fate. And so you can see that there are many, many different ways that a chemical can be an EDC. The ones we know best about are those that are acting as uh, receptor agonists and antagonists, because that's where most of the research has happened. Uh, but I think over the years, we will uh, learn more and more about these other uh, characteristics affected by EDCs. Now, here's what some EDCs look like. And I think you can see for many of them, they have common characteristics. Uh, and I can also begin to introduce you to some of those chemicals. I'm sure you've heard of many like bisphenol A and the other bisphenols. Uh, the very famous pesticide DDT, which was described uh, by Rachel Carson when she realized that it was an endocrine disruptor, didn't call it that, but um, it was uh, industrial chemicals like PCBs. And I think you can see that many of them, not all, um, but many have these ring structures and I showed you our natural hormone estradiol as an example. Estradiol is in all of us, men and women both. Um, and they, uh, estradiol also is a multi-ring structure, structure with this phenolic ring on one side that allows it to interact with estrogen receptor and then cause a downstream effect. And we believe that many of these chemicals can act the same way on estrogen and other uh, similar uh, steroid hormone receptors. Let me turn now to the evidence that EDCs affect human health. Health, And historically, this was quite a controversial area for many years. I'd say it didn't move into the mainstream until about 10 or 15 years ago. And one of the reasons that it was difficult to link EDCs to human health was because it was almost impossible to prove cause and effect because we have a very complex environment. We're all different. And saying one chemical causes a disease in a human being is uh, rather difficult. But we do have some cause and effect from some earlier uh, disasters, industrial disasters that happened uh, in Italy. There was uh, one in Japan. There was one in Taiwan back in the 60s and 70s where people were exposed to dioxins, in this case from a uh, explosion at a factory. And in the case of these Asian incidents, they were exposed to chemicals called PCBs, uh, which had contam contaminated their cooking oil. And of course they were making food for their families and people were being exposed. And over the decades, we now know that beyond the initial overt toxicity of those chemicals, was an increase in uh, different endocrine and neurological problems associated with those exposures. So we do have some cause and effect there. We also have epidemiology. One of the best examples of a, a link between an EDC and a disease is Agent Orange exposure during the Vietnam conflict, where of course local and veteran men uh, were exposed to this exfoliant. And then this was strongly associated with prostate cancer. So here's a good male example. Uh, and I will give you some female examples in just a moment. Something else that's important to our appreciation of EDCs in human health comes from studies that show the importance of the environment and, and how it contributes to disease. So for example, twin studies so that environmental factors play probably the principal role in whether a person gets a hormone sensitive cancer and these hormone sensitive cancers have been linked to EDCs. Uh, so this shows environment uh, along with genetics, of course, as playing a key role. Uh, and then finally, numerous correlations between uh, the increase in chemical synthesis around the world and similar, almost parallel increases with chronic disease. And I'll show you that in the next slide. 
Uh, so this was a figure from uh, Rob Sargis, who made it about 10 years ago, but this figure, this trajectory continues today, showing in blue uh, and on the y-axis here, uh, synthetic organic chemical production in billions of kilograms, a lot of chemicals, uh, beginning in the 1940s, and in this case through the 2010s, you can see an upward trajectory. It began in the 1940s with the chemical revolution when uh, countries were revving up chemical production uh, in large part because of warfare, but of course also to be able to manufacture chemicals that would improve human health. Uh, so uh, you have that curve. And then we also have diabetes prevalence in red and on the y-axis going up from about 1% to 6% over that exact same period with almost exactly the same curve. Now, some people argue that these increases in disease prevalence may be a matter of we're better at diagnosis now, but we were pretty good at diagnosing di diabetes in the 1960s. There are a lot of objective criteria. Uh, so this is a great example. I'll also add that there are many other disorders that have similar trajectories that um, we believe similarly are related to the increase in chemical production, and that includes things like infertility, thyroid disease, certain neurodevelopmental disorders, and others. Uh, there's been bonnet biomonitoring studies, especially from the NHANES database of the US CDC, which had uh, tens of thousands of people around the US who were interviewed for their health conditions, their diets, and from whom uh, samples were taken, like blood and urine, and more recently, breast milk samples, umbilical cord blood, to be able to then look at what chemicals people were exposed to and identifying that all people were exposed to chemicals and in most cases, many different chemicals. Um, these data from the CDC have been confirmed again and again uh, in research studies doing biomonitoring. Uh, so again, it's really not possible to prove cause and effect in humans for EDCs and relating them to chronic complex diseases. And so this is where animal studies have really become uh, invaluable and irreplaceable. So this convergence of human observational and epidemiological data together with lab animal studies have led scientists, epidemiologists, practitioners, and others to reach the strong conclusion that EDCs are environmental factors that increase the risk of endocrine and neurological disorders. Um, EDCs have moved into the mainstream. Actually, this history began earlier than 2009, back in the um, late 1980s, when the NIEHS had its first meeting on the environment and women's health. So I wanted to call that out. John McLaughlin, former director of and IEHS reminded me of that. Um, but even so, uh, I think it was really in the 2000s, um, the Endocrine Society began to play a very important role, um, putting together experts to write uh, two scientific statements, the first in 2009, the second in 2015. Uh, many of the speakers in this conference were participants in writing one or both of these scientific statements, reviewing the evidence, and leading the Endocrine Society um, really to be one of the very first big medical and scientific societies to come out with statements of concern about uh, EDCs and human health. And here are the topics that they covered in those statements. Uh, and while you read them, I will highlight uh, the ones, oops, here we go. The ones that are uh, obviously more relevant to this audience, all of these disorders, of course, are in all the disorders, uh, or almost all are in, uh, other than reproductive tract, are in both men and women, of course. Um, but there are some female-specific uh, areas of, of reproductive health, 
uh, hormone sensitive cancers in females. Uh, because I'm a neuroendocrinologist, even though both men and women have neuroendocrine systems, um, my research has shown that um, EDCs can disrupt neuroendocrine systems differently in men and women, and I'll show you some of my uh, female data. Um, but first, just a little bit on female reproductive health. Uh, this is going to be covered by some of my colleagues in this meeting, but some of the areas where EDCs are most strongly associated with female reproductive disorders, fertility, reproductive cycles, and, and premature menopause, uh, polycystic ovarian syndrome, endometriosis, endometriosis, fibroids, et cetera, all linked to EDCs. Now, EDCs have some special considerations for women. Uh, they have a disparate impact depending upon race and ethnicity, socioeconomic status, and other factors, including sex. Women have more body fat than men, and they can accumulate lipophilic substances such as EDCs uh, in that, those fatty tissues. Those ring structures of the EDCs I showed you make them lipophilic and partition into fat. Women tend to use more personal care products, cosmetics, hair products, uh, et cetera, and so they get more exposure that way. Women have unique physiological demands during pregnancy, and ex environmental exposure of a pregnant woman can potentially affect her developing fetus, and I will talk quite a bit more about that in a moment. Uh, I mentioned briefly, that EDCs, their effects can differ between females and males, and I'll say that they can differ quite profoundly. And so underscoring the importance in research and studies um, to include females in this research, because so much research uh, up to probably about 10 years ago when the NIH in, uh, introduced its initiative to uh, have a balance in the sexes in research, uh, most work had been done in males. So let me just uh, kind of in short form show you some examples of uh, the human story. We know, so there are a lot of examples linked to early life development. So for example, uh, personal care product exposures, are tied to girls' early puberty. Uh, let me say that there has been evidence uh, for more than 20 years that there has been this secular trend in early puberty across um, the last couple of decades. That has been specific to girls. And people have wondered why girls, because puberty in boys has not changed much compared to girls. Um, and incidentally, there are our race and ethnic differences in the timing of puberty as well. Um, but uh, some of the EDCs that have been tied to this early puberty are those EDCs that are considered to be estrogenic and act through estrogen receptors. Uh, and that includes things like uh, parabens and phthalates that are in personal care products. Um, other studies have big headlines about chemicals disrupting sexual development, and these are really referring to um, early puberty as well, um, chemicals and cosmetics and soap. Uh, other personal care products, not just children, but adolescents and adults. Uh, and then of course, connecting this between mothers and their children, um, there was this study uh, showing that uh, concentrations of perfluorinated compounds, these are these forever chemicals, the PFAS is, um, that are being talked about all the time now in the news as uh, having adverse health effects. Um, we now know, I don't study PFAS personally, but um, many groups have shown excellent data uh, showing that PFAS are also uh, endocrine disruptors. And here showing that what's in the mother um, can actually get to the fetus and affect postnatal birth in the, in the girl. Uh, and then finally, several other societies have taken strong stands on their concerns about exposures to EDCs, 
um, and in particular, their impact on uh, developing children. And I saw chat questions are popping up and I did see a chat question on PFAS and it is an, considered an endocrine disruptor along with these industrial chemicals like PCBs along with the plastics and BPA and phthalates, the pesticides and fungicides like DDT and chlorpyrifos and uh, vinclozolin, et cetera. Okay, so moving on, uh, let's now focus in a little bit more on the mother and her developing fetus. And this leads me to uh, introduce this concept we call DOHAD, or the Developmental Origins of Health and Disease. DOHAD postulates that when we are exposed to some sort of environmental factor early in life, it may change us or program us in some way that may not have any sort of manifestation at that time of exposure, but that change will lead us to develop uh, in a different way, a different developmental trajectory. And so uh, this concept has been absolutely crucial to the field of EDCs because of all the research that has demonstrated critical periods of development during which there is particular vulnerability because we're developing rapidly. We're undergoing all of our organs and cells are developing and multiplying uh, during these periods, these critical periods. We tend to have uh, uh, very exquisite hormone sensitivity to our natural hormones where you might imagine that exposure to EDCs um, may have quite a potent effect if we're so sensitive to the hormones at those ages. So this concept uh, really uh, underscores the point that the timing of exposure to environmental chemicals, or indeed any kind of environmental perturbation, really is everything. Uh, if we're exposed as a fetus, an infant, a child during puberty, it's possible that's when we'll be most likely to develop, to develop or to be changed and then later on have some sort of uh, endocrine disorder. Of course, every life stage is sensitive, so don't think you're out of the woods after you go through puberty, but uh, these developmental periods are particularly important. And again, this DOHAD concept is that the manifestation of disease may not occur for years or for decades. Um, much of what we know about, about DOHAD actually originated from what we call the DES story. Diethylstilbestrol, or DES, was a pharmaceutical estrogen prescribed for many decades in the uh, early to mid 20th century in this country and at different times in other countries, given to women to try to avert um, losing their pregnancies. And in, as an aside, I'll say, that it turns out DES didn't help with that. But what DES did do was expose not only the woman, but her developing fetus to this very powerful uh, pharmaceutical estrogen. And the reason that it kept getting prescribed for all those years was because when the babies were born, they looked perfectly fine. The problem was when the girls grew up, they were often found to have malformations of the uterus or the reproductive tract, uh, and a percentage of them actually developed a very rare vaginal cervical carcinoma that up to that point had not been seen in young women. And uh, physicians and researchers, especially at NIEHS, uh, were doing research and made the connection between the prenatal exposure to the fetus and these reproductive abnormalities and cancers in uh, girls later on in life. And so that's why we consider D DES the poster child. Um, it shows that pharmaceutical estrogens can cross the placenta, which people didn't think at the time, that the fetus is sen sensitive to these substances and that developmental programming happens um, differently, of course, in the sexes and is dependent upon timing. 
So now I'm going to move on to talk about uh, some of the research that's going on in my lab. We use a DOHAD model, but we do it in sprayed dolly rats. And the beauty of the rat model is we can really prove cause and effect between exposure and disease. Here's a little um, picture of what we're trying to represent in our model. And we'll start with uh, a male and a female rat, breed them. And this adult now is pregnant. So uh, she, during her pregnancy, is exposed to EDCs. And we try to model the human condition. So in my lab, uh, we give low doses of EDCs, the same kinds of EDCs that humans are exposed to. Uh, our exposure is limited to development, so that's not the same as humans. Humans have much have lifelong exposure, but um, for now, we're interested in those critical periods of development. Uh, and of course, we have a control of vehicle placebo that uh, we can give our rats. We can look at effects in the mom. We could look at, look at effects in their children. Those are the offspring. And we're also affecting the next generation, the grandchildren, because in a developing fetus are the germ cells that are going to become the gametes. So we're hitting three generations at the same time. Okay, so here's what it looks like when uh, I give a research talk, developmental exposure in utero. Uh, here are the exposed animals. So this is our DOHAD model. They were exposed uh, kind of in the middle to end of, of uh, their gestation. Uh, we have done a lot of research on single chemicals. We're also doing work on mixtures because that also is the human situation. Uh, we look at combination of EDCs with other stressors. Uh, and much of the work is focused on sex differences. Of course, today I'll talk about the findings that we make in our females. And a little later, I'll talk about the future generations because of that germline exposure that happens and allows for the transmission of, uh, of exposure effects across generations. So what I'm gonna start with is a very big overview because we've done a lot of studies, much of it is published. I'm just gonna talk you through one story, but let me give you at least a taste of the kinds of endpoints that are affected by prenatal EDC exposures in our rat model where we actually can show cause and effect and where this kind of work, obviously, I'm just one of many researchers, um, but where our body of work makes us uh, very confident these effects are happening in humans. And we look at our animals at different ages as newborns, adolescents, in adults, even in aging, and then I won't expect you to read these whole long lists of the kinds of endpoints that we've looked at, but we look at development and growth, body weight, uh, we look at uh, behaviors, we're a behavioral neuroscience lab, we do many kinds of behaviors, social behaviors, sexual behaviors, um, different kinds of affective behaviors like anxiety, uh, Emily Hills in the lab is doing some learning and memory work, uh, and timing of puberty, we look. We can look in the brain. The other beauty of the rat, of course, is we can look at what's going on in their brain as far as molecular and cellular changes. Um, we've even looked at reproductive aging and found that our animals have premature reproductive aging, similar to uh, the early menopause that is seen in uh, women and associated with uh, endocrine disruptors. So I'm just gonna uh, tell you one little story about this DOHAD work that we've done. Uh, so in this study, we used two different endocrine disruptors. One is the uh, PCB mix, Aricor 1221. The other one is uh, vinclozolin, which is a fungicide used in uh, the crop uh, and sod industry. We chose the Aricor 1221 because we know it's weakly in estrogenic. So it's hitting the estrogen receptor. Uh, vinclozolin is hitting the androgen receptor. Uh, and uh, PCBs have been banned for many years since 1979 under the Stockholm Convention, but they're still around. So we call these legacy chemicals because 
um, we're still exposed to them through contaminated soil and water and accumulation of the food chain. Vinclothalin is still in use in the US, banned in the EU and Australia, uh, and found in contaminated food and drink. Um, we give the exposure to, we feed them uh, to the moms or the vehicle, of course we have a vehicle, um, during gestation, uh, the babies are born, and then we look at uh, a number of different outcomes. So I'm going to talk about mate preference. I don't think people uh, think about the links between endocrine disruptors and the brain very often, but the developing brain in the fetus is one of the most hormone-sensitive organs in our body. I would argue that the brain is actually more sensitive to estrogen uh, than even the reproductive tract, just the abundance and expression of hormone receptors. Um, and so we're interested in how EDCs affect the developing brain through the, these changes in hormone action. Uh, we looked at how do EDCs impair reproductive success through early life programming of the brain circuits that control reproductive physiology and behavior. And so the way we assess this is to take one of our female rats who was exposed either to an EDC or a vehicle prenatally, there's no exposure after that, and then we let her choose between two males. One of these males has testosterone in his body, uh, one of them does not, we castrated that male, and naturally in the wild a female will choose a male with over a male without testosterone. And so we do a mate preference test. We have one male over here on the right uh, without testosterone. We have a male here on the left with testosterone. Here's the female running around. We can track her and see where did she spend her time. She visited both males, but in this case, she visited the testosterone male well or more, which would be expected. Uh, and here's what some of the data look like. Uh, what we found was that the EDC tr treatment did disrupt the female mate preference. Uh, so let me orient you to this slide. Uh, what these data show here on the left are the vehicle group. It's a 3% DMSO vehicle group. Um, and they're choosing between a no testosterone male, that's the white bar, and a testosterone treated male, that's the, um, the lined bar. And you can see the female prefers the testosterone male. They like, they like spending time with other animals. They're very social but they prefer, she prefers him. We saw a similar effect in the female who received vinclozal and she spent more time near the testosterone male. Um, and although there was a very, you see the slight preference in the PCB treated family or females, that was no longer significant um, in the females that got PCBs prenatally, that's the estrogenic PCB. So we wondered, was that because they just can't smell or, you know, does their olfactory system not work? So, or uh, is it something else? So rather than offering them a choice between two males, we let the males uh, urinate on filter paper and we use their filter paper. And then the females ran around and chose between the filter paper and they spent more time with the testosterone male soaked urine than the other male for the control, for the vinclozolin, but that was again abolished in the PCB treated female. So um, this disruption in odor preference probably explains the disrupted mate preference. So the next question is, is their olfactory system not working? Maybe the PCB females lose their sense of olfaction. And so we did the next study to, to get at that. We, it's called habituation dishabituation. Uh, and the way that works is we take a female in her cage, um, we offer her a little piece of filter paper, and the first piece of filter paper might be from uh, one type of male. And the first test, so this shows how much time she spends investigating it. She spends about 15, 20 seconds investigating it. Then if you give her the same paper repeatedly, she, saw, she loses interest. Um, that's normal for a rat. All the rat groups did that. So they could detect an odorant and they also lost interest in that odorant over time. If you then switched and gave them the opposite odorant, 
um, they all increased their expiration, not as much as at the beginning, but you could tell they could differentiate. And so what this shows us is that the animals were perfectly capable of uh, continuing to do olfactory discrimination. So that was not how the PCBs disrupted the mate preference or the old olfactory preference. So the next sentence, uh, the next experiment thought, okay, well maybe they can set, they have a sense of smell, but maybe the neural pathway that converts or that conveys olfactory processing um, to the brain in, and then causes some sort of behavioral output might be deficient. And so we were able to test that too. Again, the beauty of rats. Um, at the end of the study, after the odor preference test, um, we took the brains and we dissected out a number of different regions that we know are involved in olfactory preference. They don't have time to talk you through the olfactory circuit, but we know all of these regions are involved. And what we found was that of all these regions, one sub-region of the hypothalamus, the hypothalamus is the part of the brain that controls the pituitary and the ovary in the control of reproductive function. So it's considered to be part of the reproductive system. Only the part of the hypothalamus called the VMNVL was affected by the um, EDCs. And by the way, we only saw this in females. The male, we didn't have a similar effect in males. We did run males in this study. Um, and it was only affected in the PCB females. And so the way we did this, when we looked in the brain, we could look at uh, cells that expressed a marker that's called FOS, and FOS represents those neurons that are activated by the odor. And we found that the PCB group had more activated neurons than the control group, um, and similarly, the vinclozolin group uh, was similar to the control group. I'll remind you, this PCB group was the same one that did not have um, mate preference and odor preference, so we think this deficit um, probably relates uh, to some sort of functional change in this region caused by prenatal PCBs that led to a behavioral change in adulthood, a functional behavioral change. So the deficits in mate and odor preference were associated with increased FOS in that part of the hypothalamus in females, uh, not in males. Okay, I also wanted to give you uh, a little bit of the story about the multi-generational EDC effects, which I alluded to at the beginning of my talk. Um, so reminder that when the mother is exposed, her child, that's the F1 generation here as a fetus is exposed, um, that child, child, the F2 generation is sitting there in in the, if it, the child is a girl, is sitting there in the girl's ovaries um, and uh, will become the next generation, the grandchild. We also know from a, an increasing body of work from a number of labs that if you breed animals out to an F3 generation, a great grandchild, these animals have not been exposed to um, the EDCs. The F2 generation is the last generation to have received any kind of EDC exposure. Uh, and so this generation, if you see a phenotype, must have uh, received some sort of heritable information from the previous generation. And we believe that this happens through what we call epigenetic uh, mechanisms. We don't believe that, that what's happening in these guys is uh, mutation or genotoxicity because certainly in my studies where we're doing the exposure to low dose CDCs, um, we don't expect there to be an increase in mutation rate. Whereas um, epigenetic changes, which are changes not to the DNA backbone or the DNA structure, um, which would be mutations, uh, epigenetic modifications are those that affect whether and how the DNA is going to be expressed and uh, be turned into proteins and, uh, and functional units that then are involved in physiolo physiology and behavior. 
Um, so just a reminder to myself to tell you that when a pregnant woman is exposed, so is her fetus and the germ cells. But the F3 generation is not exposed. Okay, so getting back to my rat model, um, before I told you about the doe hat animals, that F1 generation, uh, now I'm going to be talking about if we continue to breed these animals out. And our model allows us to uh, differentiate between uh, legacy chemicals. Those are things like the PCBs that have been banned but are environmentally persistent versus contemporary EDCs we're exposed to today, like vinclozolin or other pesticides. Uh, these chemicals may act through different mechanisms and in estrogenic versus anti-androgenic. Um, we can look at the combination of our ancestral indirect and our direct personal exposures. Um, our work builds in a very important concept, which is that who you breed, you can breed when you breed the offspring, if you breed the father or the mother or the boys and the girls, you can breed both paternal and, and maternal lineages. Um, you can look at the male and the female offspring and get at sex differences. Um, and we can also look at epigenetic programming mechanisms. So the model that uh, David Cruz and I developed to do this work, we call it two hits of EDCs, three generations apart. Let me orient you to that model because it's complicated. Uh, so we start the exact way we do for our DOHAD model with the pregnant rat exposed to the same chemicals, uh, the vehicle, PCBs, or vinclozolin. Um, and when they're exposed, of course, um, their uh, F1 offspring are exposed, both the males and the females. Um, in this case, we're breeding through a mom, so F1 generation, uh, directly exposed. If we continue to breed these animals out another three generations, then we arrive at the F3 generation that had no direct exposure, so their only exposure was heritable, presumably epigenetically inherited, we call this ancestral exposure. Um, the second hit of EDCs, three generations apart, is given to F3, a subset of these F3 females, or um, the F3 or the F3 males will breed them with uh, untreated females. We'll do a second hit here, exactly the same way, and then again, um, breed out for uh, another generation here. This F4 generation has both direct and ancestral. And then finally, the F6 generation has a double ancestral hit of EDC. So thank you for bearing with me. I know that's a complicated model. Um, we focused on the F4 generation because of this direct and ex ancestral exposure. And I'm just going to show you four quick slides of data. Um, to orient you, um, in this case, I'm showing you the uh, direct direct exposure first, the F1. Um, just, let's just focus on the females. Uh, this is body weight on the day of birth. The three treatments are uh, the DMSO vehicle, Aeroclor 1221, and the vinclozolin. And these animals uh, had early puberty, or excuse me, had early uh, or decreased body weight on that day. Um, when we breed out, Four generations later, there's a second hit. So the double hit is indicated here, DD, you know, D2 vehicle, um, the same hit or a different hit if we switch the order of the chemicals, breeding through maternal and paternal. Um, and through the maternal line, we had no effect on body weight. But in the paternal line, I think you can see there are lots of effects on the body weight after birth. So we have these emerging um, phenotypes, if you will, across generations. Now here, I mentioned puberty mistakenly before. Here's the puberty data. Actually, in this particular study, um, puberty was not significantly earlier. It was a little earlier in the females. Um, but early puberty emerged in the F4 maternal generation breeding through the females. Um, the females in the F4 paternal gen generation, in this case, um, were, did not have a change in the timing of puberty. Uh, 
We did a lot of behavior. We looked at in the open field test, which looks at the time rats spend in a big box. They tend to like to be in the corners. Um, the more time they spend in the corners, the more kind of risk averse they are. Uh, in the here's, I'm just going to show you the F4 maternal. Um, and uh, in this particular case, uh, we saw a difference um, in uh, this group in particular that got Aerochlor ancestrally and vinclozolin more recently. This behavior was not affected in F1, so it emerged across the generations with that second hit. Um, and oops, and finally, uh, we did a lot of informate. We did a lot of work on social internet interaction dynamics, looking at time rats would spend choosing between either another rat or nothing. And rats tend to be very social. Um, so Ross Gillette worked out this whole machine learning. Uh, tool to be able to assess sociability um, and found in the F4 females again, both the maternal and the paternal lineage each showed um, decreases in the non-social time uh, compared to the control group. And you can see that here to a lesser extent in the paternal generation. Okay, so let me wrap up uh, the two hit three generations apart model showing that each generation had a unique phenotypic response to EDCs. Uh, we refer to the emergion phenotypes as those caused by EDCs that accumulated over generations, where there may not be an F1 phenotype, but where a phenotype may emerge, um, especially after that second hit in the F4 generation. Whether the animal got the same EDC, EDC hit or a different one across generations was had played a key role in determining the outcome. Uh, we think this is relevant to both humans and wildlife because as EDCs come onto the market, this is overlaid on our uh, historical exposures. Uh, although I did not show you any male data, um, you can look at my papers and see that Almost everything we look at, we see sex differences. Uh, and as you saw, the maternal and paternal lineages played key roles in determining outcomes. So whether you inherited it from uh, you know, great grandparents that were male or females made a difference. Uh, so let me end here with some take home messages and future directions. EDCs affect women's health, and this includes reproductive health, as well as other domains in the world of endocrinology and uh, neurological and behavioral uh, areas. Sex differences are common, underscoring the importance of including females in all studies. Individuals experience multiple environmental perturbations throughout their life history, such as EDCs and other stressors, and their combination will shape the individual's phenotype Ancestral epigenetic processes add to this complexity by shaping the response to current and future environmental challenges as modeled in our two hit three generations apart paradigm. And what we are trying to do now in the lab is to pursue how the transfer of epigenetic information from one generation to another and from the germ cells to a somatic tissue such as the brain can happen and uh, result in neurobehavioral changes. This work has really lagged in the women's health domain because it's much easier to do epigenetic transgenerational work in males because often we will collect sperm to do that. It's much more difficult to get oocytes, um, but we are uh, starting to do that work right now in the lab. So let me stop there by thanking of course, the wonderful people in my lab who did everything, um, and especially Ross Gillette, Emily Hills, uh, Lindsay Thompson, Madeline Streifer, and Dana Scheinhouse, my collaborator, David Cruz, uh, my rats, the undergraduates, and of course, the NIEHS, which has been amazing in uh, funding this research. So I'm sorry, I can't seem to forward anymore, but I did have the NIEHS logo up there. Um, so I will stop there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Gore, for joining us today and for 
providing such a great overview of EDCs to all of our group. Um, as you mentioned, we do have several questions that have come in, and so we're going to attempt to take the questions in the order received. Um, during your talk, you mentioned plastic medical tubing. Will plastic resins be considered as a category? Plastic resins? Uh, I'm not sure I entirely know. It, let, me, let me maybe try to reword that question. I think what we're most concerned about are um, the chemicals that are in plastic that um, can be in IV tubing, like phthalates, and leach out into fluid. Um, I don't know if they're in resin form, how they leach, but uh, I think people who are doing work like in food packaging and who are studying uh, the life cycle of plastic have expressed a lot of concern about eating plastic and liberating them into, um, you know, just about anything that comes into contact with them. Thank you so much. What would you say is a larger public health problem, dioxin or PFAS? Ooh. So I don't usually, uh, I don't, I think they're both huge public health problems. Um, I think we can do more about PFAS right now because uh, it, it's used in more limited ways, whereas dioxin tends to be synthesized as a byproduct in industrial uh, reactions. So certainly dioxins are still a huge problem, and we have to do everything we can to um, not inadvertently manu manufacture them. But I think with PFAS right now, um, we have the opportunity to maybe get some regulatory bodies involved. I know the EPA um, is has really taken interest in trying to uh, ban certain types of PFAS, but we also have to remember it's a whole gigantic category, so they ban them one at a time. So I hope people out there will uh, put pressure on uh, lawmakers and policymakers to ban all of them. We shouldn't really be banning categories of EDCs one at a time. We should be banning them as classes. Thank you so much for that. Can EDCs <clears throat> accumulate in human tissues? Yes, that's an easy one, especially lipophilic tissues like fats. <clears throat> okay. Um, Increases in diabetes also follow the increasing prevalence of the Western diet. Have you found any research that address the Western diet as it integrates and um, has an impact on EDCs? Right. So that's a great question. So these, the, and it really kind of gets to a bigger question, which is that every disorder that is studied as associated with EDCs has is multifactorial in the contributions to what are gonna cause that disease or not. Of course, there's the genetic side of things. There are all sorts of lifestyle um, issues, not just diet, but exercise and where you live. Do you live close to uh, an area where there's a lot of industrialization? Um, so I don't, I haven't done that work myself, but there have been some groups uh, epidemiological groups and clinical groups that have um, related how much of certain chemicals are in the body to the likelihood of having a certain kind of disease, including diabetes. Um, and those studies are really good because they take into consideration the other lifestyle factors like obesity or diet. And what many of them have shown is that even if you factor out the other factors, the EDCs alone, um, are a contributor to that increase in prevalence in diabetes. Great. Thank you so much. And for our last question in the interest of time, um, have you found any research that shows that – I apologize –
um, <clears throat> any long-term studies regarding progesterone or other fer fertility assistant medications um, that may be available? Uh, I'm not sure I understand the question. <clears throat> like, are there progesterone disrupting EDCs well, maybe? Other fertility assistant medications on child health later on in life and, and the impact of child reproductive health. Maybe they're asking about like uh, contraceptive. Yes, and, and the long-term impact of progesterone and similar medications. Yeah, so, you know, that I don't have the expertise there. I don't study those drugs as pharmaceuticals. Um, my understanding from people that I've spoken to is that in general, there uh, have not been connections found between like contraceptives and um, health problems, either in exposed or offspring. But I will say that I don't know that literature very well. So I would, you know, want somebody with more expertise to weigh in on that. Thank you so much again for speaking with us and for sharing your research again. We appreciate you and we look forward to working with you in the future. Thank you so much. I so appreciate being invited. Thank you. So we are going to now transition to our first panel. And I will begin by introducing our panelists that we are so gracious to have with us today. Four panelists, the first of which is Dr. Anne Marie Uchik, who leads the Fertility and Reproductive Health Group and also has a secondary appointment in the Reproductive and Developmental Biology Laboratory. We also have Dr. Francesco DeMeo. Dr. DeMeo is a senior investigator and chief of the Reproductive and Developmental Biology Laboratory and head of the Pregnancy and Female Reproductive Group at the National Institute for Environmental Health Sciences. Our third presenter and panelist will be Dr. Carmen Williams. Dr. Williams is a senior investigator in the Reproductive and Developmental Biology Laboratory at the National Institute for Environmental Health Sciences. And our fourth panelist is Dr. Janet Hall. Dr. Hall is a senior investigator at the National Institutes of Health and clinical director of the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences. And kicking us off, is Dr. Anne Marie Uchik. Please begin. Thank you very much for that introduction. Thank you for inviting me here to speak today. I am going to talk about our research with vitamin D and fertility and reproductive health. Uh, while we focus on many chemicals within my group, this is um, the focus of my talk today. So vitamin D is known as the sunlight vitamin, and that's because it's synthesized in the skin in response to ultraviolet B radiation exposure. And it can also be absorbed from the diet, fatty fish, and fortified milk products. Either way, vitamin D circulates through the body to the liver and is hydroxylated to form 25-hydroxyvitamin D or 25-OHD, which is how I refer to it in this presentation. So 25-OHD is the accepted biomarker of vitamin D status, where low levels can be uh, classified as less than 20 nanograms per mil or less than 30 nanograms per mil, depending on the professional recommendations that you follow. Animal studies have shown that vitamin D deficiency is associated with decreased follicle development, decreased ovulation, and decreased corpora lutea, increased uterine hypoplasia, and decreased fertility. These are data from the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey, or NHANES, and the chart shows the levels of 25-OHD across different age groups. And you'll notice that the lowest level of 25-OHD is in the age group 20 to 49, or the reproductive aged um, group. And the mean level is approximately 25 nanograms per mil, again, hovering around those low levels that I mentioned in the previous slide. 
The prevalence of deficiency ranges from 14% to 75%, and that is different across racial ethnic groups. So at first in our group, we wanted to look at whether vitamin D was associated for, with menstrual cycles and menstrual cycle length. And to do this, we use data from the Time to Conceive cohort, which is a prospective time to pregnancy cohort of women aged 30 to 44 in the Triangle region of North Carolina. And these participants were enrolled early in their attempt to become pregnant, and they provided a blood specimen, which was measured uh, for 25 OHD. They were also given ovulation tests and pregnancy tests in order to report when they conceived a pregnancy, and then they were followed for pregnancy outcomes. And here, this table is showing our results, looking at vitamin D and long menstrual cycles. And in the first row, you can see that a 10 nanogram per mil decrease in 25 OHD level is associated with approximately a 20% increase in the odds of long menstrual cycles. When we looked at it in categories, a less than 20 nanogram per mil level of 25 OHD was associated with approximately three and a half times the odds of long cycles. A level of 20 to less than 40 was associated with almost twice the odds, and this is compared to a group of at least 40 nanograms per mil. So we also wanted to look at the length of the follicular phase. If you remember the animal studies that I described earlier showed influences on ovulation, timing of ovulation, and the uh, uh, appearance of corpora lutea. So we wanted to look at the follicular phase length, which is the length of time between menses and ovulation. And on the y-axis, I'm showing the predicted probability of a long follicular phase from our data in the time to conceive cohort. And on the x-axis, I'm showing the level of 25 OHD. And you can see that there's a clear decrease in the probability of a long follicular phase or delayed ovulation with increasing 25 OHD. So in total so far, lower vitamin D is associated with higher odds of long cycles and delayed ovulation. We next moved on to looking at vitamin D and the probability of conception. And this table shows the results of that analysis, uh, 25 OHD and its association with fecundability, where fecundability is defined as the probability of conceiving in any given menstrual cycle of attempt. And the fecundability ratios are shown in the right-hand column. And for a 10 nanogram per mil increase in that first row, you see a 10% increase in fecundability. So increasing 25 OHD was associated with increased probability of conception. When we looked in categories, there was a tendency for people with less than 20 nanograms per mil of 25 OHD to have lower fecundability, although the confidence interval was wide. And there was a tendency for people in the highest category to have increased fecundability, so a 35% increase for a level of at least 50 nanograms per mil. So to put our results in context, these are all of the existing studies of 25 OHD and the probability of conception. And on the y-axis, I'm showing their um, uh, measure of effect, whether it's a risk or an odds ratio. And across the x-axis, you can see the first authors for the studies that have been published in this area. And as you look across, all of the effect estimates are above one, which indicates increased fecundability or increased probability of conception. So the existing literature supports an association between vitamin D and conception, although with varying levels of precision. And in our study, the association was seen at high levels of 25 OHD, at least 50 nanograms per mil. So we then moved on to looking at vitamin D and pregnancy outcome. And in our data, 25 OHD was not associated with a lower risk of miscarriage in either our unadjusted or adjusted models. However, there was a meta-analysis published last summer where they looked at a 25 OHD level of less than 20 versus greater than 20 nanograms per mil. And you can see that they're reporting almost twice the odds of miscarriage in the group with less than 20 nanograms per mil of 25 OHD. And they also looked at less than 30 and greater than 30 nanograms per mil, and again reported an odds ratio of 1.6. So increased odds of miscarriage for lower levels of 25 OHD. So then we wanted to look at 
the underlying pathways that might relate vitamin D to menstrual cycle function, conception, and potentially miscarriage. And so we started to look at endocrine pathways. And in particular, there are some of the animal studies suggested that decreased estrogen might be a pathway for the effects of 25-OHD or vitamin D on reproductive function. However, in the literature, we've only found four studies that have looked at this, and lower vitamin D was associated with lower estrogen in two human studies. The figure comes from a paper where we looked at 25 OHD and estradiol across the menstrual cycle. And across the menstrual cycle, we see lower levels of estradiol for the lower 25 OHD group. However, two other studies did not report this association. And there is one clinical trial that's looked at vitamin D supplementation and reported decreased progesterone on day 21 of the menstrual cycle. However, they did not account for ovulation timing, which could be influenced by vitamin D supplementation, as I showed in that previous figure. So from this, I concluded that more data are needed to characterize the endocrine response to vitamin D treatment. And so we have launched the Investigation of Vitamin D and Menstrual Cycles trial, or the INVITED trial. And the primary aim of the trial is to examine the effect of vitamin D supplementation on the hypothalamic pituitary ovarian axis hormones, with a secondary aim to look at endometrial decidualization. And I'll talk more about that in a minute. The study has two phases. Phase one is a pre-supplementation phase. It's one menstrual cycle long, and the participants collect daily urine and daily diary information. And then we measure 25 OHD, and in phase two, if they were deficient, they receive supplementation. A random sample of people without deficiency are chosen to receive placebo so that nobody knows if they were deficient or su sufficient. They provide two menstrual cycles of observation in phase two, where they perform ovulation tests. And in the third cycle, they again collect daily urine and provide daily diaries. We're also collecting menstrual effluent in this study, which is collected by means of a diva cup, which is shown in this picture. So to talk a little bit more about our secondary aim, decidualization is the process of the uterus remodeling itself for pregnancy. And what we're particularly interested in in these studies is the uterine stromal cells. The stromal cells in preparation for pregnancy change shape. They begin to secrete numerous and, uh, cytokines and proteins. And the decidualized cells will also secrete IGF-BP1, or insulin-like growth factor binding protein 1. And this can be used as a marker of the decidualization response in uterine stromal cells. So we also did a pilot study using stored human uterine stromal cells. And this was done in collaboration with Northwell Health. And the stromal cells were stimulated to decidualize. And remember that higher IGF-BP1 means more decidualization. In our control cells, we see that progesterone increases decidualization. So this is what we would expect to happen. And this is without any vitamin D present. In the vitamin D treated cells, we see a stronger decidualization response in the absence of progesterone. And we see an even stronger response in the presence of progesterone. So it could be that vitamin D enhances the effects of progesterone on decidualization. And we're excited to repeat these experiments in the invited trial with the menstrual effluent samples we're collecting in the trial. So in total, menstrual cycles, or lower vitamin D is associated with prolonged menstrual cycles and delayed ovulation. Higher vitamin D is associated with increased conception rates. Higher vitamin D may be associated with reduced pregnancy loss, and underlying all of these observations could be decreased estrogen or other endocrine factors, or uh, an effect on uterine decidualization. And either one of those might explain the uh, outcomes, the associations with the outcomes that we've seen. In total, vitamin D may be a low-cost intervention for improving reproductive function or fertility, and I just want to acknowledge uh, all the fellows in my group and the collaborators on the trial and our funding sources, including from the Office of Research on Women's Health. And if we don't have time during the panel for any questions, you can feel free to email me. And I appreciate your attention. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Dr. Yuchik. We appreciate you and you sharing more about your research on vitamin D and its impact on menstrual cycles. Um, we do have one quick question that I'll try to get in here. Um, for vitamin D studies, are there any broad geographic patterns in func functability and reproductive outcomes related to patterns of greater sunlight and vitamin D levels in certain regions of the United States and the world? Uh, it's interesting. We're actually working on a study right now where we're looking at this. We're looking at ultraviolet light patterns across the, the world to see how they correlate with vitamin D. I think the issue that we've had looking at geographic patterns is that sun avoidance behavior um, has become uh, very prevalent. So people avoid sunshine uh, because of its effect, associations with skin cancer and sunscreens and things like that. So um, there have been seasonal patterns to vitamin D, and there could potentially be with these outcomes, but it's hard to look at that because of this avoidance of sun. Thank you so much. We will move on to the next panelist, and if time permits, we will take more questions at the end. And now we're going to move into Dr. Francesco DeMeo. Thank you so much. Over to you, Dr. DeMeo. Uh, thank you very much. I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me to present our work on uh, on understanding what regulates uterine function and identify the pathways in which endocrine disruptors can impact uterine function. Um, so I, maybe I stand corrected by Dr. Gore, but I think the uterus is one of the most sensitive organs for endocrine signaling, just like the brain. Hormones control cell-to-cell -cell communication, which is critical for uterine function. And since it's regulated by hormones, uh, endocrine disruptors do impact uterine function. Uh, dysfunctions of the uterus inc uh, include infertility, endometriosis, endometrial cancer, fibrosis, and preterm birth. And all of these can be attributed to hormonal dysregulation. And our goal is to study how and how what are the pathways regulating this process to better understand how endocrine can disrupt this, can uh, regulate stress and, uh, and, and, and impact uterine function. So we use the mouse as our model. Uh, this is a non-pregnant mouse uterus. It consists of a circular, two circular layers of muscle, the myometrium, surrounding an internal glandular, uh, glandular uh, function called, a glandular structure called the endometrium, which consists of epith uh, luminal epithelium, glandular epithelium and stromal cells, as well as vascular and, and immune cells. Uh, and there's a tight communication between the epithelium and stroma. And then upon uh, uh, hormone regulation and embryo can implant, it forms close approximation with luminal epithelium and then causes a change in, in the stromal cells to a decidualization, which we've heard Anne-Marie talk about. Uh, we also like to study the human and... Uh, Again, this is just a diagram of the human menstrual cycle. Just like uh, the mouse, estrogen regulates proliferation of the urine epithelium. Progesterone comes in, uh, inhibits the proliferation of, uh, of estrogen, and causes differentiation of the epithelial and stroma. In humans, the decidual process is independent of of uh, is independent of embryo implantation it occurs naturally. If the embryo implants, you get pregnancy. If the embryo doesn't implant, then the uterus undergoes menstruation. And this is just to recap what Anne-Marie said about the decidual process. It's a change in the structure of the stromal cells from a fibroblastic to an epithelial-like phenotype, and it's critical for supporting embryo implantation uh, in the invasion of the embryo, the blood supply to the embryo, and also protects the embryo against the maternal immune system. And so, as mentioned by Anne-Marie, um, you can collect endometrial stromal cells either by surgical endometrial biopsies or... or um, or uh, the, by collecting menstrual fluid. And we'll talk about a procedure we we've, uh, uh, are working on at the end of the talk. You can isolate these cells. You can treat them with cyclic AMP, estrogen, and and, uh, psych, uh, and, uh, and, and, and methoxyprogesterone acetate. And then you can look at several, more, aside from morphology changes, you can look at IGFPP and prolactin changes in the, in the uterus, in the, in the cells. So we we work on the, progesterone receptor. Progesterone is critical. As you'll see, it acts to its uh, cognitive uh, progesterone receptor. There are two isoforms of the progesterone receptor, the PRA and the PRB isoform. And this is a critical hormone. It regulates the timing of delivery of the embryo to the uterus. 
it inhibits the mitogenic action of estrogen on the urine epithelium. It's an integral part of the paracrine crosstalk between the epithelial and stroma. It regulates the ability to support embryo invasion and growth, regulates myometrial quiescence, and it regulates and controls uterine receptivity. The critical thing about progesterone is it's a protective hormone that actually protects from estrogenic endocrine disruptors. Endocrine disruptors, so like you know, BPA or genistin, as well as uh, stalates, can inhibit you know, progesterone action, and progesterone function is to protect the uterus from those uh, actions. And this is just a progesterone receptor diagram. It has a ligand binding domain, which binds the hormone, a DNA binding domain, which binds the DNA, and then it's got a long amino terminal. And depending upon the isoform, it, it has a shorter uh, amino terminal, the PRA, or the longer, PR, uh, longer amino terminal the P, for the PRB isoform. And this is critical in regulating the distinct function of the receptor. Each of these isoforms have distinct functions in regulating uterine uh, function. And over the years, we've tried to look at how does progesterone regulate uh, uterine uh, epithelial proliferation. And we've identified this uh, epithelial stromal crosstalk, which starts with progesterone in the epithelium, inhibiting estrogen receptor in the epithelium, as well as triggering a whole bunch of transcription factors and growth factors which signal to the stroma, and in the stroma, these uh, regulate the, the inhibition of growth factors which promote estrogen action. So stromal progesterone receptor and epithelial progesterone receptor are both critical in protecting the uterus from estrogenic actions and the role of endocrine disruptors in causing this hyperplasia and disruption of uh, uterine function. So our goal over the last couple of years is to identify what factors may interact with the progesterone receptor to regulate its function and protect the uterus from, uh, from, from, from uh, agents that cause dysfunction. And so what we've done over the years is we've identified where progesterone receptor binds in the genome. And uh, here is a list of, and this is work done by Steve Wu and, and, and Ryan Markworth. We've identified a progesterone responsive uh, element, the PRE, which, which, which functions to bind uh, in enhanced regions in front of genes. And you know, next to a lot of these progesterone receptor response elements, we found the sequence of, of, of uh, nucleotides that correspond to a CARG DNA binding site. And we were curious about this because it's known that this CARG binding site is bound by the transcription factor serum response factor. Serum response factor is a critical response factor in regulating all aspects and all tissues of function and development. Uh, it's essential for uh, heart and GI tract development. And if you look at what serum response factor does, it's a dual function transcription factor. With myogenic transcription factors, it can regulate muscles contractility and cytoskeleton. And we actually found SRF binding near progesterone receptor in the myometrium when we're trying to understand what's regulating parturition. It also works with other transcription factors in regulating, regulating proliferation and differentiation. So our goal was to identify what serum response factor is doing in the uterus of mouse and humans in regulating urine function and decidualization in the human. And why is SRF uh, environmentally critical? Well, if you go to the comparative toxic genomics databases, these are a list of the top compounds that interact with SRF expression or function, benzopyrene, bisphenol A, and a lot of the compounds we've heard talked about by Dr. Gore in, uh, in, in her first talk. When we overlap the SRF compounds with those that are, well, interact with progesterone receptor, we find that the common theme is that SRF and, and progesterone receptor are all regulated or all, in, or, or, all in, or, or, or impacted by these trans, you know, estrogenic endocrine disruptors. So in order to understand what SRF is doing, we knocked it out in mice and also knocked it down in, uh, knocked it down in, uh, in, in endometrial stromal cells. Go back. So our hypothesis was SRF and progesterone collaborate to regulate transcriptional environment needed for uterine function. And what we found is when we knocked SRF out in the uterus of mice using our progesterone receptor cream model, the mice were sterile. Uh, they had, uh, because SRF regulates muscle contractility, the embryos actually didn't even make it to the uterus. They were stuck in the oviduct. So how do we identify what SRF has done in, in the uterus? So we looked at an artificial decidualization response in the uterus. 
we overectomize mice and treat and treat them with estrogen and progesterone, and then we traumatize one uterine horn. When we traumatize one uterine horn, it shows an increase in in in, in size and the expression of marker proteins. And on the on the left, you can see a control mouse with a stimulated uterine horn undergoing the decision response. When we knocked out SRF, the mouse did not undergo a decision response. So this told us that SRF was critical for regulating uterine function, and we wanted to understand what what uh, what functions were being regulated. Also, when we looked at the uterus of aged mice, we saw an increase in fibrosis, and we we attribute a lot of the infertility involved in these mice with this increase in fibrosis of the uterus. This is a Mason trichrome stain, blue stains, a lot of uh, extracellular matrix proteins, and as you can see on the control mice, you see very little blue, and on the right. Uh, right, and you see a histology with a lot of blue showing a lot of fibrosis of the uterus. So we identified, we, we went and asked, what is the role of SRF in regulating progesterone's gene expression? So we conducted RNA seq. And here is what happens when you overactomize mice, treat them with progesterone, and knock out SRF. And you can see that we have down regulation of SRF, which was nice because we knocked out SRF, along with a lot of cytoskeleton proteins, MYH11, Taglin, and, and ATAG2. What surprised us was on the right, we saw an increase in a lot of estrogen markers, lactoferrin, and MUC1, as well as a lot of inflammatory markers. So when we looked at the, the bar graph on the right, we see that we have upregulation, a lot of inflammatory pathways, and we have a downregulation of a lot of anti-inflammatory muscle pathways, and glucocorticoid and dexamethyl pathways are anti-inflammatory pathways. This told us that SRF is critical for controlling the inflammation in the uterus uh, in, 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 the, in this case. So then the next thing we did was we compared the transcriptomes of wild-type mice treated with progesterone with SRF knockout mice treated with progesterone. And the non-intersecting areas are those that are regulated independent of progesterone or SRF. And what you can see is that progesterone regulates a lot of anti-inflammatory pathways when you knock out, and when you, when, when you, uh, when you treat with, uh, with knockout SRF, we have a lot of increase in the inflammatory pathways. And this just shows the upstream regulators when we knock out SRF are all inflammatory pathways and uh, myogenic pathways. So we, what, what SRF is doing is it's helping progesterone control the inflammatory milieu of the uterus. So how does this relate to humans? And so we underwent decidualization in endometrial stromal cells and we knocked down SRF and we looked at what the gene expression pattern was. And you can see that when you knock down SRF, you decrease decidualization, just as observed in the mouse, but you also increase the expression of inflammatory cytokines. So in both mouse and human, SRF appears to be an anti-inflammatory transcription factor controlling this, and we hypothesize that this is what leads to the inflammation. When we compare all the data, we show that in the, in the, in the blue, we show that progesterone promotes uh, uh, protection against inflammation, whereas in stromal cells and in our uh, mouse models, we have SRF uh, and, uh, you, know, pr you know, promoting inflammation. And so what we want to conclude is, you know, SRF is critical for mouse fertility. It regulates the hormonal induction of the surgery response in both mouse and humans. Uh, it's a loss cause results in uterine fibrosis. Uh, it's critical for human endometrial uh, uh, decidualization. And it promotes inflammatory pathways, loss promotes inflammatory pathways in both mouse and humans. So as mentioned by Anne Marie in the beginning, I just want to come up with a new technique that you can isolate endometrial stromal cells from, from menstrual fluid. You can also isolate endometrial organoids, epithelial organoids from menstrual fluid. So what we've worked on over the last year was to be able to take menstrual samples from women and isolate both epithelial organoids and stromal cells from the same patient. So what we do is we, you know, as mentioned by Anne Marie, uh, women are uh, volunteers are given a diva cup. Uh, we collect the menstrual fluid, and then we can separate stromal and organized by centrifugation and running the st stromal cells over a bicol column, and then plating them out, and then just plating the organoids on top of uh, a plastic and looking at them grow. And as you can see. We can, from the same patient, isolate organoids, these nice round circular uh, circular figures from the menstrual blood. 
and uh, we can I isolate uh, endometrial stromal cells from the same patient. And this is important because we can, in the same patient, look at the responsiveness of uh, the epithelial and stromal cells to hormonal treatment. The, uh, the stromal cells deciduize, and these are three, these are four different patients. And you can see the responsiveness of gene expression of all these four patients are completely different. And, and, and when we look at the organoids, they are estrogen responsive, but again, the responsiveness is completely variable between the different patients or volunteers. And this just shows you that hyper-responsive epithelial cells and hyper-responsive uh, stromal cells or low, low responders don't really correlate to the same patient. In some patients, we have high responders uh, in the organoids and low responders in the stromal cells. And I think understanding what's going on in this patient variability is critical. But the importance of doing this is it's a non-invasive means of collecting both epithelial and stromal cells for culture. Uh, you can match the patient's organoids with potential, uh, you know, you can co-culture experiments to identify the interactions between the epithelium and the organoids in the same patient. And you can conduct age and environmental effects paired with the patient uh, on the epigenium of the uterus. I think this is, um, this is a, a really easier way than in the old days where we ended up collecting endometrial biopsies from patients and culturing, culturing uh, the, the, the hormones. And it's a, it's a rapid way of collecting this, a non-invasive way of collecting this from patients. And we're really excited about looking at the role of, you know, you know, patients with different exposures on how it affects not only the stromal, but the epithelial uh, effects uh, uh, phenotypes. And this is uh, my lab here in the middle, I, and uh, this is the entire reproductive development biology lab. And uh, we're really excited about uh, continuing this work. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. DeMeo. We appreciate you sharing with us your research that you've done on pathways to EDCs and some of the uterine changes during pregnancy. Um, we have one question that I'm going to address. Uh, does hypovitaminosis D exert an influence on the development of PCOS? So I don't know about PCOS. I mean, we've been collaborating with Anne Marie on the role of vitamin D. And as she observed in the, uh, in the human, we also see an impact on decidualization in mice on mice under a vitamin D deficient diet. We've also undergone the mechanism of how vitamin D impacts deciduization, and we feel that vitamin D, actually, the receptor, represses uh, deciduization, and the ligand actually removes that repression. And it, although it doesn't regulate estrogen receptor, it does regulate estrogen sensitivity, which may have an effect on PCOS. But, uh, I mean, that's a nice collaboration between Anne-Marie's lab and my lab that we're, uh, we're, we're, we're working on uh, for the future. All right, thank you so very much. And our next panelist that we will have today is Dr. Carmen Williams. Over to you, Dr. Williams. Thanks very much. Um, I, I today am gonna talk about work we've been doing that really was highlighted in Andrea Gore's initial presentation. Um, and, and what I'm hoping that you take home from this is not specifically information about the system I use, but a general um, concept of how endocrine disrupting chemicals can interfere with development in a way that affects future function. So we know that the environment influences development and a lot of it is genetically programmed by whatever your genes are. And if you have mutations, it can be a problem. But as Andrea mentioned, and others have raised this issue, there's also epigenetic programming where things that are not included in the DNA sequence, such as proteins around the DNA, drive exactly how the genes encoded in that DNA are expressed and therefore drive the function of different cells. We also know that the environment itself can change how development happens. And this was probably initially evolved because it's really important for an organism to adapt to the environment so that when it's born and grows up, it can actually be efficient. But then if development is altered, 
um, and then the environment changes for the adult, that can also reduce fitness. I don't need to repeat the DES story, but as Andrea mentioned, it's the poster child of um, having a developmental exposure results in a permanent change in function later in life, much later in life in adulthood. And the patterning of the reproductive tract was the major cause of problems for women. You can see in the images here, I'm showing you two uteri. One is the classic uh, with triangle-shaped lumen and kind of thick endometrium seen in a normal woman. Uh, but next to it is a T-shaped uterus that was observed in females exposed to DES in utero. And the abnormality in the uterus, as well as other abnormalities, for example, in the fallopian tube, caused infertility and pregnancy complications, in particular preterm birth. And as Andrea mentioned, there was also an increased incidence in these adults in vaginal cancer, as well as what I don't think she mentioned in breast cancer later in life. Well, obviously, um, the timing of exposure is critical from what Andrea said. And so a number of years ago, after the connection between DES and abnormalities in um, female offspring became apparent, Retha Newbold and John McLaughlin at the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences set up this mouse model of neonatal DES exposure. So in the mouse, the uterus and whole reproductive tract differentiates between the time of birth and puberty. So there, it's already formed. So the major structures are formed at birth, but they don't become um, the, the mature shapes and functions until really close to puberty. Well, if you expose a mouse to DES after birth and then let them grow up, they are all infertile as young adults, and then over 90% of them develop uterine cancer as older adults. What I think is super interesting about this model is that if you actually remove the ovaries pre-pubertally, so before they have their own endogenous estrogen on board, they never get cancer. And that tells us that this DES-induced cancer requires a second hit of estrogen. Well, we don't give DES anymore, right? But there are plenty of estrogenic and endocrine-disrupting chemicals that are in the environment, has, has been reviewed already. In addition, we actually give soy-based infant formula to many babies, and within soy-based formula are isoflavones, the most abundant of which is genistine. So Ritha and uh, John McLaughlin set up, you know, another trial to say, well, you know, these are natural estrogens, unlike DES, that's a pharmaceutical. And if you give genistine at the same time th and then measure levels of genistine in the mouse serum, you get a range from about six down to two micromolar. Well, this is almost exactly the same range of genistine that you find in the serum of human infants who are drinking soy-based infant formulas as their only source of uh, nutrition. And what that tells you is that dosing, the dosing strategy we're using in the mouse model results in a very relevant serum level. Well, then when we do the experiment and say, okay, if you give genistine or vehicle from day one through five of neonatal mice, what happens? Well, 100% are infertile as young adults. And as older adults, there's probably a little bit lower incidence of cancer, but many of the mice that are exposed to genistein also get cancer. Well, how does this work? We know that there are no mutations that are induced in oncogenes or in tumor suppressors in the cancers that develop. We also have done studies showing that there are permanent changes in epigenetic marks, but it was really not clear how these marks caused cancer development. And this is sort of relevant to how does an early endocrine disrupting chemical exposure change physiology so that the cells behave differently and can result in changes. So we decided to use what was a new approach at the time, which was single cell RNA sequencing to figure out how this early DES exposure changes the cell types and causes cancer development. 
So it was a very simple experimental design. We gave DES day one through five and collected the uteri of the older adult mice. And we isolated living uterine cells for single cell RNA sequencing analysis. So what you need to know about the uterus and the uterine cells is that the uterus has adult epithelial stem cells. And these stem cells actually generate progenitors that become either the luminal or the glandular cells that Franco mentioned in his talk. And then they go on to form the mature cell types, the luminal epithelium or the developing and mature glandular epithelium. What we did in this study, which has a whole lot of data in it that I'm not even gonna talk about at all, but we focused mainly on epithelial cells and their differentiation. This is what's called a UMAP of the epithelial cells only from the DES exposed and the control mice. Each dot on this UMAP represents a single cell and they are placed on the map depending on how close their gene expression resembled those of the ones of the other cells. So cells that are the farthest apart on this map have the most different gene expression profiles. And what we found was that if you analyze the gene expression of this group shown on the top left, these were luminal epithelial cells. And the ones here at the bottom were glandular epithelial cells. The ones at the top right were basal cells which is a cell type that we only normally see in the DES group. And then there was this huge unidentified set of cell clusters present in the middle that we didn't know what it was. So then what we did was we said, okay, which of these cells came from DES and which of these cells came from controls? And what we found essentially was that all of the luminal and glandular normal epithelial cells were from controls. All the basal cells were from DES, no surprise, but the huge cell population in the middle was almost all DES cells, except for a few pink cells that you can see right in the middle. So then what we did was we took only the control epithelial cells and re-clustered them. And what we found was again, um, just three clusters. One was luminal epithelium, one was glandular, and a third cluster appeared when we did it this way. And those it turned out to be were epithelial stem cells. We did the same thing with only the DES cells. And again, just got one major cluster. We had removed the basal cells from this analysis because we already knew what those were. But then what we did was we said, okay, where are the stem cells in the DES group? And what we found was that that one little cluster of stem cells actually mapped and formed those pink dots that were sitting on top of the DES group that we didn't know what it was. And so our overall analysis of what is going on in this model is that in a control, there are glandular, luminal, and epithelial cells. The epithelial stem cells form the luminal progenitors and the luminal mature epithelium. They also form glandular progenitors and the mature glandular epithelium. But if there is a disruption event early on by an estrogenic chemical, the mice get uterine cancer. And what these uterine cancers develop from is a single progenitor cell population that has characteristics of epithelial stem cells, as well as both luminal and glandular cells. And it forms abnormal luminar, luminal epithelial cells and abnormal glandular cells that in work I haven't shown you that we've also done on looking at the stromal cells in this model. Together, they cause the formation of cancer. So that's really in the weeds, but now let's back up and think about just development in general. You take a cell that's got DNA from the mom, from the paternal line and the maternal, and there's, you know, it's sort of undifferentiated. There aren't epigenetic marks that are telling the cell what to be. And that cell then acquires epigenetic marks as it differentiates into a mature cell type. But an environmental trigger will change the epigenetic marks in a way that gives you an adult cell that maybe looks pretty much like 
one that wasn't exposed, but it actually has different marks. And then in the presence of a second environmental trigger can have a different adult function and in some cases can go on to make cancer. So this work that I just told you about was largely carried out by Wendy Jefferson and Lisa Padilla Banks in my group, as well as Brian Pappas, who is a bioinformatics specialist at NIEHS. And I'll conclude. Thank you so much, Dr. Williams. We appreciate you sharing with us about your research on DES exposure um, and are very grateful for you joining us today as well. In the interest of time, we're going to save the questions for the end of today's panel discussion. And so we're going to move into our fourth and final presenter during our first uh, presentation or first panel presentation of the day. Our next presenter is Dr. Janet Hall. Over to you, Dr. Hall. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Um, first of all, thank you very much. And um, it's really a pleasure to have been invited and to join you all today. I'm really going to start. Um, basically, the title of my talk is uh, really focused on the effects of um, EDCs on ovarian aging on and menopause. I'm going to primarily be presenting data from epidemiologic studies, um, but I wanted to give an initial basis for that. So um, basic science studies have shown that throughout the development of the ovary from its development in utero all the way through ovulation and corpus luteum function, um, we see that various environmental chemicals um, can have effects. So BPA on germ cell nest breakdown um, and all the way through to preantral follicles and the antral follicles, but other chemicals also become important as we move through the development um, of the ovarian follicles. So I'm going to talk a little bit about these chemicals and what these effects at different stages of the in the ovary have on um, our clinical markers of ovarian aging. So let me first start with talking about, again, reviewing you know, the bad actors. Dr. Gore mentioned the incredible number of um, chemicals that are in our environment, but there are a number that are particularly bad in terms of the studies that have been done, um, both in animal models and, and in humans. So persistent organic pollutants, pesticides, PFAS, phthalates, BPA, and metals are all the endocrine disruptors and have been known to have effects um, in the human. So let's just start with persistent organic pollutants and pesticides. These are highly carcinogenic compounds. They um, are found in electrical equipment like capacitators and transformers and in hydraulic fluids. They were actually banned in the U.S. a very long time ago and somewhat later internationally, but they are still present in products that were manufactured before 1979 and in landfills. The problem is that um, persistent organic pollutants are forever chemicals. Essentially, they don't degrade. They are, and they accumulate in food chains and are present in the soil, air, and dust. The specific ones that we have information on are PCBs, which you've heard of, dioxins, and polyaromatic um, hydrocarbons, as well as certain pesticides. The studies that um, have been conducted from an epidemiologic and smaller group studies indicate that earlier menopause um, in some studies has been shown to occur with PCBs um, as well as dioxin, but definitely with certain pesticides. In addition, premature ovarian insufficiency, POI, has been found to occur in all of these situations. In some cases, 
these are associate have been associated or we have information in fact that allows us to know that increased fsh which is a marker of menopause and increased lh and decreased amh um, are also associated with these persistent chemicals We've talked a little bit about PFOS, so just as a reminder, they're found in consumer products like carpet, leather, apparel, textiles, so many different things. Exposures can occur through contaminated soil, drinking water, food packaging, and air. Um, and in fact, in studies, um, in NHANES studies, so um, the national health uh, studies, PFOS has been detected in an incredibly high percentage of the population. Phase out programs are in effect, um, but they've been a long time coming and they're slow to happen. So let me just talk a little bit about the NHANES study. Um, this has shown that women with higher PFAS levels had an earlier age of menopause, and that's consistent across all the different kinds of PFAS and the things that have been um, chemically manufactured to replace them, unfortunately. Um, we wonder if this could be a reverse causation, but we actually don't think so. Um, there's evidence to suggest that they're not higher um, because of the way the body has handled them. In the study of women across the nation, which was a very large study that um, followed midwife left mid-life women um, to their final menstrual period, again, we saw higher levels of PFOS, PFOA associated with a shorter time to menopause. That was particularly true in white women um, for reasons that are very unclear. Um, again, this earlier time to menopause was associated with a higher FSH, FSH level as we would expect. Um, and um, there was in fact a dose response uh, relationship for PFOA and um, PFOS, um, and uh, an inverse relationship with um, estradiol. And again, um, the study analyses really re and design really removed concerns about reverse causation. So what about the phthalates that we've talked about? Um, so phthalates are, again, used in the manufacture of plastics. They increase their flexibility, transparency, durability, and longevity. longevity. They're in solvents and personal care products. Um, and it's very interesting because the problem with them is that they don't evaporate easily and they don't chemically bind to the material that they're added to. So again, they become persistent in the environment and they have long-term effects through the epigenetic um, mechanisms that have been discussed earlier. Phthalates are banned in the EU, in Argentina, Japan, and other countries. In the US, we haven't moved quite as far ahead um, and they are not completely banned in the US. It depends somewhat on state, um, but they are restricted. So what about phthalates and earlier menopause? Again, if we go back to NHANES studies, women with the highest level of one of the phthalates experience menopause 3.2 to 3.8 years earlier um, than those with low levels. And in the midlife women's health study, the baseline analysis from a longer, this longitudinal study of 45 to 54 year old women show that there was almost a 20% increased odds of recent hot flashes and almost a 40% increase in frequency um, per doubling of the summary response. So this is a big change. Um, in a smaller cohort, higher concentrations um, from the use of personal care products um, resulted in, um, you know, a 45% increase of experience in hot flashes, which can be a marker of menopause, although not all women experience hot flashes. But again, longitudinal analyses found that individual metabolites 
or associated um, in, in a dose response way um, with hot flashes. So the EARTH study is a study looking at um, premature ovarian uh, insufficiency and poor IVF outcomes. And in this study, one of the findings was that women who were undergoing assisted reproductive technologies had urine concentrations of one of the phthalate of um, one of the phthalate metabolites that were inversely associated with the number of eggs that were retrieved, with clinical pregnancy, and with live birth. I'm going to turn next to BPA. So BPA. Um, is is a um, endocrine disruptor that we've heard a lot about and that we know has been removed from some of the water bottles um, that we use on a daily basis. Um, BPA is used in food packaging. It lines the interiors of food and beverage cans, water pipes, dental feeling, fillings. Um, the concern or one of the major concerns is that repetitive exposure of certain BPA containing products to light and heat or contact with cleaning agents and aging of the product itself may result in increased leaching of BPA into food or beverages. So this is why it's really important for you to go through you, you know, your pantry um, or your shelves in the kitchen to make sure that your canned products have not expired. Um, human exposure is widespread, and again, in NHANE studies, um, BPA has been detected in 93% in the U.S. population. Um, unfortunately, a safe level of um, BPA has not been established, which again is a concern. What about the effects on reproductive aging? So we've seen that diminished ovarian reserve has been identified and that follicular fluid BPA concentration was in fact inversely correlated with AMH and E2 levels. So the higher um, the levels, the lower um, AMH and E2 were, and those are and those are markers of healthy um, ovarian function. Um, and again, these have been confirmed in animal studies. I spoke earlier about the Earth study. Um, BPA was detected in 80% of the women in the Earth study, but the average decrease in antral follicle count, which reflects kind of the active or the functional um, follicles in the ovaries that contain the eggs, um, was again, decreased in a dose response way in relation to BPA. So what about metals and earlier menopause? Nurses Health Study has shown that the odds ratio for menopause under 43 was five times higher for women in the highest compared with the lowest um, third of individuals with lead, of, uh, lead exposure uh, measurements. And N. Haynes also showed an increased odds of menopause that was linearly associated with increasing lead levels. So just as a summary of what I've talked about, um, here you'll see the effects of the chemicals we've been discussing on earlier menopause and early reproductive age and persistent organic pollution, pollution sorry, pollutants, um, bad actors across the board as are pesticides, PFAS, phthalates. BPA has been shown uh, to have a negative effect on early reproductive aging, although we don't have studies to um, demonstrate that in terms of earlier menopause. And metals have also been associated with earlier menopause. So as, I'm sorry, as I thought there was one more to come. No, um, but as we are finishing this, <clears throat> the point that I had wanted to make that didn't pop out was that this is kind of bad news. Um, and it's very depressing to 
um, a younger population of women, especially. Um, but there are, are things that can be done about it in terms of both the regulatory environment, but also the way in which we um, look at the things that we use. Um, you know, are hair straighteners really essential for us? Do we have to use certain um, personal care products um, that have these substances in them? And we absolutely need to do a better job of looking at labels. We're going to be talking about, or others are going to be talking about this later on, um, but it's something that's very important for us to think about. So with that, I'll stop, um, and thank you very much, and I'm looking forward to the rest of the meeting. Thank you so much, Dr. Hall. We appreciate you, and again, thank you for sharing your research on PFAS and earlier menopause. Um, I'm going to address a couple of questions that are for any of our four panelists, so please feel free to jump in. Um, the first one is if you would not mind addressing uterine malformation along with other cervical changes that are seen in DES? Um, I can handle that um, from a clinical perspective. Um, so um, one of the groups of patients that were referred to, that have been referred to me over um, my life have been patients who are daughters of mothers who were DES exposed. Um, and the common abnormality in these women is, is a T-shaped uterus. And it's, a t you know, normally the uterus has a body um, and uh, has the ability to grow with a pregnancy. But this... Um, but t a T-shaped uterus is not as big to start with, so there's not as much space for implantation to occur. And also, it's not nearly as flexible so or adaptable, I guess. So one of the um, concerns is that you just don't get implantation in a normal way. The other concern, though, is for ectopic pregnancies. Um, because the pregnancies do not implant, because the eggs do not implant in the uterus and do not even, I don't mean the eggs, I mean the embryos, and don't even get to the uterus, they can develop in the tubes, and that can be disastrous. All right, thank you. Um, this also can go for any of you. Um, there were several discussions of the use of menstrual fluid. So the question is, do you think that menstrual fluid could be considered a non-invasive source of endometrial organoids that may be able to enable a population-wide study of early disease? Yeah, I can answer that. I mean, I, I think we showed that in our that was actually work that was published by Margarita Turco that you could do that. And I think it's very exciting that you could do that. I, I think it opens up a whole new frontier and especially to be able to build, uh, isolate stromal cells and organoids from the same patient. Since there's a stromal epithelial communication, basically extremely exciting and it's relatively easy. And I think, I think that thanks to Jan and the clinical research unit here, we've been able to, you know, accumulate a lot of volunteers very rapidly. So, it's very promising. Great, great. Um, a challenge to the field of endocrine disruption is that there are many substances that are diverse and may not appear to share any structural similarity other than usually being of a small molecular mass, making it very difficult to predict whether a compound may or may not exert endocrine disrupting actions. Can you speak to that? Um, with the size of some of the compounds? Well, I, I think, you know, some things you can predict and some things you can't. And what we think is if the more pathways we identify that are regulated by, you know, in the uterus for function, once you get compounds where you don't know what to interact with, you can do a transcriptome or a single cell or any kind of molecular analysis and then work your way back to find out what pathways they interact with. I, I think combining basic mechanistic research along with some toxicology will allow you to do that. I mean, if you just do toxicology and dump compounds on cells, you're sort of reading the tea leaves sometimes. And if you do mechanistic stuff, you're sort of uh, you know, agnostic to what's going on with the compounds. I think combining the both is what we've been trying to do. 
Yeah, it's actually interesting, Franco, to, to um, expand on that a little bit. I think one of the things that happened um, much more recently in the toxicology field is um, beginning to use uh, methods for evaluating compounds that don't require long-term mouse studies. And so the um, the specific kinds of technologies that Franco just mentioned are becoming increasingly possible and I think may give us some earlier indications of um, the toxicity of a wider variety of compounds than we've been able to look at. Great. Thank you so much for that. This next question is regarding fetal brain development. And as the blood brain barrier has not yet completed its development during the fetal development stage um, and development of the nervous system, is it possible that the fetus is more sensitive to all neurotoxins? I think that's probably an Andrea Gore question. <laughs> Can you hear me? This is Andrea. <laughs> Please jump right in. Um, yeah, I would I would agree that the fetal, it's not just the blood brain barrier, it's also right. uh in the fetus, that's when the hormone receptors are beginning to be expressed. That's when neurogenesis and neural migration is happening. Um and those neurons and their support cells already express hormone receptors at those ages. So you're not only hitting cells that are already sensitive, but you're also catching them at a life stage where um, when those neurons, uh, you know, migrate and make synaptic connectivity, um, where that gets established and is never going to change for the rest of your life. So at least as far as anatomical position. So the fetal, the fetus is definitely most uh, sensitive to hormones during that stage. And I'm sure the, the minimal blood-brain barrier at that time is also a part of it. Thank you. Um, with all of the great discussions and wealth of information that we've learned about EDCs, a question has been posed as to, is there a method by which levels of EDCs can be tested? And if found, can EDC levels then be offset? Um, so, so the answer is yes. Um, it depends. Uh, so there are a lot of the studies that I reviewed in um in the, that can be reviewed in the epidemiologic literature um, have in fact used, um, have tested EDC levels in blood or sometimes in urine, depending on how fast the specific EDC is metabolized. Um, and this has formed the basis for um, um, a number of the concerns that we have where we, kind of understand from basic research studies that they there is a mechanism through which they work. But then we also have studies like NHANES where they have been, where some of the EDCs have been monitored and measured in blood. Um, and those things are put together really to give us a much better sense of the importance of each of the chemicals. If the question is, can you do this clinically, i.e., can you check your own EDC levels? Um, at the moment, that's not something that's done. Um, is that something that I think we should do for the future? The answer is absolutely yes, um, because the idea of personalized environmental health uh, I think is something that we are absolutely striving for. I just want to follow up on what Jan said. So a lot of time environmental exposure has already happened and there's nothing you can do about it. I mean, it's water under the bridge. So I think by doing mechanistic research on identifying what pathways you can come up with ways to ameliorate the impacts of this. That's why, you know, factors that can control uterine growth proliferation or 
you know, ways to diagnose what's going on, Marcus, you know, and, and how to treat that are something that we're interested in, in pursuing. And I think, you know, you, you, you can prevent it, but sometimes the PFOAs are forever compounds. In North Carolina, they're here forever. So we just have to learn what do, what do they do and how to deal with it. Yep, and I'll just add that that's one of the reasons I'm interested in vitamin D. I mean, we see beneficial effects of vitamin D, and we don't know what caused originally changes in those menstrual cycle characteristics. But if vitamin D can help to improve reproductive function, then maybe there is something that will help. Yeah, yeah and I, I, I think would like to mention that uh, tomorrow in my talk, I will be addressing interventions. Um, which have their limitations, but still it's very exciting to see about the vitamin D study. Uh, and I'm sure there will be others forthcoming. So thank you. Thanks, thanks Linda. And I, thanks, Linda. And I, I think just to follow up on Anne-Marie, so, you know, when you think of vitamin D infertility, that's one thing, but, you know, I think we're finding that if vitamin D regulates estrogen sensitivity, then vitamin D may be a way to protect yourself against estrogenic environmental disruptors, right? Because, Vitamin D, you know, you know, regulates uh, the, the, you know, and, and then you could work like that. So I think all of these will come to play as we learn more about the pathways and mechanisms regulating, you know, function of the reproductive system. All right. Well, thank you again so very much to Dr. Gore, as well as our four panelists, Dr. Uchik, Dr. DeMeo, Dr. Williams, as well as Dr. Hall. We appreciate you all, and I will turn things over. At this time, we will transition to the Gather Town platform for our virtual poster session from 1115 to 1215, followed by lunch. Instructions to join Gather Town can be found on the symposium website, in the Zoom chat, and linked on the HHS live stream site. A link to the website and a direct link to Gather Town are now available in the Zoom chat. If you are joining us on Zoom, we strongly recommend you keep your Zoom webinar open during Gather Town portions of the event to provide a smooth transition when we return to Zoom at 1 p.m. Gather Town is a virtual environment, and we encourage you to engage with your colleagues much like you would in an in-person event. The functionality of Gather Town is very user-friendly. Please make sure your camera and microphone access are enabled, and you can use your arrow keys to move around the space. When you click the link to enter GatherTown, if you move your character using your up arrow, you will see the poster hall and networking rooms. If you navigate down, you will see a help desk if you have any questions. Feel free to explore the environment. There are couches, tables, and benches available for networking as well. You may also refer to the event website, which provides further instructions and screenshots for easy navigation. Feel free to join GatherTown at this time to set up your character and ensure your camera and microphone are enabled. We encourage you to use some of the break time to familiarize yourself with GatherTown environment. When you enter the virtual poster hall, there is a directory available to easily find our many scholars. If you have any questions, please navigate to the GatherTown help desk or find one of our staff members. Produced by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services.